Good morning. Good morning. It is a great pleasure for me to declare open the first annual Ebony Excellence Conference. This conference was organized by the leadership of the This conference was organized by the Leadership Steering Committee Tri-Chair. This is a student-led conference that includes keynote speakers and presenters over multiple fields of study and profession, professions. The purpose of this conference is to inspire and empower women by gathering a community of scholars, educators, and future academic and career success of minority women. I welcome keynote speakers, presenters, students, guests, family, and friends. I would like to extend your greetings from the tri-chair. Tashani Castillo, biology major, Patience Bawara, social work major, and I am Jasmine Anglin, a sophomore political science major from Albany, Georgia. <laughs> this year's conference theme, Rise Up Women, Eliminate the Inequalities in Our Communities. Our keynote speakers today are Tomoji Jackson, Dr. Akusua, Barthwell Evans, the Harvard Bells, and Kimberly A. Collins. I would like to elaborate on the Harvard Bells. These are a group of young women, including this tri-chair, who attended the Alumni of Color Conference at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The AOCC is a conference that brings awareness to the educational issues impacting communities of color. We were fortunate to present our personal narratives through Bennett's past, present, and future. We have some of the bells here today, and they will come up after I share this video with you guys. Five minutes to Harvard.
Jones, Journalism Media Studies major, freshman from Ames, Iowa. And my favorite part of the Harvard trip was actually getting to see and be on Harvard's campus because Harvard is something that you only see in like TV shows and movies and it would seem like it's not real or it's completely impossible to go to school there. But being there made me really proud and made me realize that like, if I wanted to go there in the future, it's totally possible. And I also, on the trip, got really close with my Bennett sisters who um, I didn't really know before we went on the trip, but going on the trip made me get close to them in ways that I never would have gotten to know them if I hadn't gone on the trip. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Patience Mukura Shisha. I'm a social work major and I'm a junior. I'm originally from Zimbabwe. I am here to share with you a little bit of my experience from Harvard University. My visit was made um, easy by meeting uh, Bennett Bells, who are now attending Harvard University. They gave me a tour of the university, and I had a feel of the prestigious Harvard. So my take home was that if my sisters could do it, I mean, were able to enroll at Harvard, that means I can also be a Harvard student. Thank you. My name is Nandi Rupendele, and I'm a sophomore business administration major from Durham, North Carolina. And today, I want to talk about my experience while I was in Boston. So my first favorite thing about Boston is when um, Dr. Sobe took us to her favorite Dominican restaurant. I felt more of my element in that neighborhood. At first, we were walking downtown. And you know, I'm not going to lie, it was a little weird. We were like shouting, it. not shouting at us, but basically saying with things like fix your face and it was just weird but then when Dr. Sophie took us to the other side of town you know I felt more at home the food was bomb.com we all connected over the food we got to know each other well even though we go to the same school it was just it was great that day just I feel like it kicked off everything and from there you know we kept bonding even more and I realized that I have a lot in common with my sister Mills that I never knew. Um, Major from Auburn, Georgia, and I just wanted to tell you guys my experience at Auburn. Going to Harvard at first, I was very skeptical. I was nervous because I know going to Harvard, you have to be in pink cues because it's very prestigious. Um, being away from school and being with my baby sisters, I opened up more because being away from the school says we kind of get got to bottom. So I was very appreciative, and a lot of us got to open up. So. I just want to say it was the overall experience, and I thank you. <laughs> thank you. I just want to say it was the overall. So now some of the Bennett Bells will come up and share their experience. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Naomi Dolby. I'm a sophomore special education major from Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, what we did was, during the presentation, each group had an ask for the audience. So we had past, present, and future of Bennett College. And um, I was, I, I was from the. What was that from? <laughs> I was from the present. present. But we're going to start with Trinity because she was from the past of Bennett College. Okay. Oh, well, I was the past. Past. Was past. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Nandiri Bendele. I'm a sophomore business administration major from Durham, North Carolina, and I'm going to read my ass. So at Harvard, I said, today my sister Bells and I are asking you to stand with Bennett and help preserve our legacy by sharing our stories via Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and through other platforms you can connect to your community. As black women, our education has been threatened too many times, and this is where it ends. Um, as of today, we still have people standing with Bennett through social platforms and helping to preserve our legacy. Thank you. So again, I was the president and our ask was, stand with Bennett by connecting us to families, individuals, and organizations who can provide financial and economical advice that will ensure the long-term security and stability of Bennett. 
So while we were at Harvard, there were some people who were so moved by our stories and what we were telling them that they actually donated that day and people are still donating. Um, hi, I'm Trinity Jones, freshman journalism media studies major from Ames, Iowa. And so the narrative I told was basically about um, how Bennett has really impacted me in the short time since I've been here because I went to a predominant, I came, I came from a predominantly white town in school and so I was really, um, my self esteem was really low because I never saw anyone that looked like me but coming here at Bennett where like everybody looked like me, that was really encouraging and inspiring. So my ask was, which is why I thought the future, I think the future of Bennett College is very important because there's girls like me who need that upliftment and encouragement and my ask was, um, I ask you to stand with Bennett by connecting us with individuals, entities, and organizations focused on diversity, people who are into embracing individuality and inclusiveness in educational institutions, because Bennett is a place that has and will continue to produce confident and successful black women. So my ask was, um, Stand with Bennett by connecting us with people and organizations. Oops. So. Okay. Stand with Bennett by connecting us with people and organizations who are interested in the empowerment and edification of young black women. And. I want to thank you, ladies. You can go ahead and sit down, because my next part is involving someone. I have to get. <laughs> Finally, I would like to close my speech by wishing the conference every success. I have every one of you. I hope every one of you will have fruitful and meaningful exchanges. Thank you. So it was from this ask that I was able to connect and uh, to make meaningful relationships with some of the people who are in here today. I'll say my name again is Patience Mukurajija. I'm a junior social work major and I'm from Zimbabwe. My Harvard trip was very ama was amazing and opened a lot of networking opportunities with people who love Bennett and professionals who are willing to stand with Bennett. It was here that we were able to recruit one of our guest speakers today, Timoji Jackson. Timoji is a lady and a woman known as the empowerment specialist. She is a best-selling author of seven books and an award-winning speaker and educator. She hosts the internet TV show and international podcast series and a YouTube channel as well. Timoji is an experienced corporate trainer and keynote speaker who facilitates at businesses and universities nationwide on leadership, strategy, success strategies, diversity and inclusion, emotional intelligence, student engagement, and other purpose-rooted topics. She is also a certified life coach at Stage Garden Care Center and an adjunct faculty member at the North Carolina Community College. As an ordained clergy, she serves as a national evangelist and youth pastor at the Citadel of Faith Christian Fellowship. She is currently in a, a doctor in ministry candidate, ABD, with an anticipated graduation date of spring 2020. She holds a master's in human services and executive leadership, and she tells everyone her most prestigious degree is the Bachelor of Arts and Science in Empowerment Strategies that she obtained from Bennett College. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming the phenomenal Timoji Jackson. I 
I was supposed to have it all. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I had a mama and a daddy in the house. I grew up in a house, a two-family house that my parents were able to buy as teenagers, two unwed teenagers who gave birth to me and two other siblings. I was supposed to have it all. Though neither one of my parents were college educated, my father dropped out when mommy got pregnant, mommy had me, went back to school and obtained her high school education, but both of them were there. I was supposed to have it all. My daddy grew up so poor in Sanford, North Carolina, that there were times where he did not have shoes on his feet. And so he made sure his children could have it all. So he told me as a young girl, he said, you are beautiful. And being beautiful is going to open a lot of doors for you. But my question, dear, is what will you say when you get in there? Mm -hmm. So you better make sure you're as smart as you are beautiful. I was supposed to have it all. But something happened. Their daughter went to Bennett College in 1991. Don't start at it. <laughs> Before the internet, before we could look up our schools, I knew I was coming to school in North Carolina. So I come to Bennett College. We have been called several things, and one of them has been an oasis. A place, a, an oasis is a watering hole, right? It's a place of life in the midst of a dry desert. That's what Bennett was for me. I get here, have an awesome first year. Sort of, my grades could have been better. <laughs> but what happened when I got here was that the girl that I was began to meet the woman that she would become. So what ended up happening was when I went back to that picture perfect home in Brooklyn, which wasn't picture perfect, because I didn't tell you about the abuse. I didn't tell you about seeing my mama with black eyes. I didn't tell you all of the other stuff. I only told you what I wanted you to know. You know, kind of like social media. <laughs> I get to only share with you what I want you to know. And so I can paint one picture and tell you, yeah, I lived in a two-family home. They both made great money. Everything was cute from the outside. Oh, but if you knew what happened on the inside. So I go back home now, and I have, you know, a little confidence in me now. Got a little strut in my walk. You know what I'm saying? I've been free for a whole year, uh -oh. right? You know, pre-internet and all of that good stuff. My first cell phone was this big. It came in a case and it had a zipper that went around. So, you know, your parents couldn't keep up with you like they do now. So I came home a new creature. And my daddy had looked at my mother because something had happened between them. And he said to her, I should slap you in your effing face. And my face just made a face. Now I'm old school. You respect your parents, right? But my face made a face. Any of you like that? Where you can't really hide what you're feeling? So when my face made a face, my daddy looked at me and said, don't you ever look at me like that in my home again. And at that moment, my daddy went upstairs to my room. Because I grew up in Brooklyn. So we carry knives, we carry guns. I had a little 22 automatic. I never saw that gun again because that day he knew mm -hmm. that something had awakened in me and that if he had put his hands on my mama, I might not be here today. So when I left for school to come back to this campus that we stand on right now, he told me, and don't you ever come back home again. Mm -hmm. And I did. 
And that was over 25 years ago. And from that point in time to the point in time where he died a year ago in April, I had no relationship with my biological father. But I should have had it all. Because social media says if you have two parents, they're both making six-figure incomes, and you live in a home, and this and this and that and that, you're supposed to have it all. They sent you to college. You're supposed to have it all. So the story is not done yet. I end up dropping out of school, dropping out of Bennett College, because now I have to figure out how I'm going to feed myself. My daddy has cut me off. My mother's in an abusive marriage to my daddy. And although mama still snuffed me money, snuffed me food, did all the things that a mama is going to do anyway. You know what I'm talking about, right? This was a day and age where your phone bills were printed. And it showed every call, every number, how long you were on the phone for. So she called me at work, from work. And she would call my dorm, State and Pfeiffer, and she would send me money. I would go down to the post office and get it. So Mama did what she was supposed to do. However, now I have to drop out of school. I have to get a job. I have to feed myself. And then life happens, right? Mm -hmm. I fall in love, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I get married. <laughs> I has me some children, right? Not knowing that the issues that I was harboring from the relationship with my father dictated the man that I would marry, right? Because what you go through is going to form you one way or another. And so, now I'm in a marriage to a man who, although never put his hands on me, had a different kind of abuse. We had decided I'm going to stay home and I'm going to raise these two babies. So what he was going to do was he was going to control the money. Now let me tell you something. I like money. Okay? So my parents worked hard because they didn't have it when they were growing up. So they worked real hard to make sure we had some growing up. When I came to bed, I had a brand new car. My daddy took me to the dealership and said, baby, what you want? Pick it up. OK? So now I'm married to this man who's going to tell me, you're going to give me $100 a week? Who are you talking to, boo? <laughs> like, what? And you want me to buy groceries and take care of these kids? So I should have had it all. And I spent 15 years into a marriage that I knew on day one wasn't going to work. So your conference theme is to rise up. See, you have some brilliant educators in this room, and they're going to talk to you about some phenomenal things and some phenomenal experiences in the corporate world, in the world of academia, and what they've gone through to get to the prestigious positions that they sit in today. But I, what I want you to know is that if you don't deal with this stuff, if you don't dig on deep inside to this stuff, that you can make six figures or even seven and still have issues. You can marry the man, or it's 2019, the woman of your choice, and still have issues if you don't get in there and deal with it. So my topic today is to find your helium. Find what will lift you, transform you, and elevate you beyond your past and beyond your pain. Because education alone won't do it. You can get a PhD and still be messed up. Money alone will not do it. You can start that tech company and become a billionaire and still be messed up. Because we do know that the richest man in the world right now just wrote his wife a check for what, 37 billion? So the money alone.
world won't do it. You're going to have to dig on deep. And you're going to have to be able to find what will lift you up when you believe I should have it all. I checked the right boxes. I went to school. Check. I got a degree. Check. I got married. Check. I had the children. Check. I've got the great job. Check. I should have it all. So why is this happening to me? Your past will keep you in bondage, be it good or bad. So you may have had none of the struggles I had growing up. But here's the thing when you get caught in the past, whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's over. You can't live in your past. You're going to have to make some choices right now. Your job, what the past does for you, is allow you to learn some lessons. That's what it does. It builds some character into you. It begins to pour some things into you that we can't teach you in the hollow halls of Bennett College. Your past is preparing you for your present. <laughs> Your present is preparing you for your future. So all you need to take with you from your past to rise up are the lessons. If you let your past define you today, you're paying for it not once, not even twice. You're paying for it three times. Because if what you've been through, you pay the price for it then, if you're stuck there, you're paying a price for it now. And if you're stagnant, what you do now determines what you do later. You're paying for it again. Who goes into a, bad, a restaurant and has a bad meal and say, let me pay for it three times? <laughs> but we will eat woulda, and we will eat coulda, and we will eat shoulda over and over again. You're going to have to rise up, find your helium, find what's going to lift you beyond your past and beyond your pain. Because if you don't, my dear sister bells and friends, there's some women here with some more age and more experience than even I have. And they will tell you, if you don't deal with it, it's going to be waiting for you. You can't bury it. Anything you bury is going to blossom one day. Mm -hmm. So you can bury it and think, oh, I'm good now because I went and I lost my little weight, so now I'm skinny and I was always fat or whatever. I'm going to bury this now because, yeah, so my parents didn't have me in wedlock, but, oh, I had my kids in wedlock, so I'm good now. You can do all of that thinking you buried what you've been through. It's going to show back up when you least expect it. You're going to be getting in where you're fitting in and then be like, where did this problem come from? I never dealt with it. I want you to rise up. Find what will lift you. Because when you put helium into a balloon, it takes this flabby little piece of rubber. And it takes it from that, and it begins to fill it up. And as it fills it up, it begins to transform it into what it should be. And as it's transforming, it is elevating it to where it belongs. There is an elevation waiting for you ladies, for each and every one of you. Where are my youngest ladies in the room? Right here. Right. How old are you, baby? 11 years old. How many of you wish you could have heard all of this when you were 11? <laughs> we are going to rise, and let me tell you what the greatest helium in life is. The truth. Mm -hmm. The truth. 
is the thing that will lift you, that will transform you, and that will elevate you to where you belong. If you're going to rise up, you're going to have to do it in your truth. College is a wonderful time of your life. You get to start defining who you are. And so, yes, mama instilled this into you. Grandmama still instilled this into you. Daddy instilled this into you. Grandpa instilled this. Your aunties, your cousins, your friends, they poured these things into you. But now you got to sift through that stuff because all of it ain't good. And if you're going to rise up, you're going to have to begin to discard the stuff that don't really belong to you. Some people have poured some things into you that don't belong to you. Mathematics is my favorite discipline. I teach it currently at the community college. I met a beautiful young lady here today who was probably a student at Winston-Salem State when I was over there working for the TRIO department and I used to stu uh, tutor stat, algebra, and a couple other things. But I have so many students who don't like math because their mama told them it was hard. Mm -hmm. They don't like math because their daddy told them we ain't good at math. But when I sit them down, as an educator, I can tell who has the mechanics down. I can see who my engineers are. But the problem is no one ever told them, baby, you're an engineer. You are mathematically inclined. Because what's taking me 50 times to go over with this student over here, and they still can't get percent times whole equals part, still can't tell you which part is the percent, which part is the whole, and which part is the part, you, regardless of whether I give you these two elements or these two, you're able to plug them in. You can see it. You are an engineer, but you thought you hated math because that's what your mama told you. Some of y'all can't swim because your mama are afraid of water. <laughs> you ain't afraid of it. Your mama was afraid of it, so she didn't take you to the water. I'm here to take you to the water, ladies. <laughs> that your parents, even if you had great, wonderful, excellent parents, that there are some things growing in your garden of thoughts, ideas, and beliefs that don't belong to you. And it is your job to pluck up the things that don't belong to you. Some of y'all gotta pluck up the fact that one of you is, one of you is dark skin and your other sibling is light skin and your mama show favor to the light skin one. <laughs> Some of you gotta pluck up with the fact that the other sibling did good in school, you didn't do good in school, so your mama was always favoring that one and didn't pat you on the back. You gotta pluck that up. See, that's that past hurt. That's that past pain, right? Some of you got to pluck up that you went and had you a baby by the time you were 16, but your sister waited and she got married, and that's the one. You got to pluck that up. That's not your problem. That's not your problem that your parents didn't get it. See, I also used to work for this institution. So I had the opportunity to speak and counsel with girls all over this country. And depending upon who you are, a baby at 16 can be the best or the worst thing that happened to you. It just depends on your support system. I have seen it turn the life of a young lady around in a way to where she finally began to fight to become all that God has called her to be. And then I have seen some who supposedly had all the elements to have it all fall beneath the weight of their mistakes because they were too busy trying to be perfect. So as I close right now, you are going to rise up beyond anything and everything that somebody has tried to program into you and become everything.
everything that God says you are. Thank you. Wow. We need more time, don't we? <laughs> At this point, um, Timothy Jackson will, uh, will take some questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand so we can see you and uh, tell us where you come from and who you are so that we may know you. Thank you. You said on math, specifically yes. math. Yes. So thanks to the internet, there's a million and one programs. But there is a book that I absolutely love to teach my adult students from, and it's called Refresher Math. You can go online, it's a red book. And what it does, because math is a progressive subject, right? If you can't add and subtract, you'll never be able to do fractions, right? So if you get that math, that book, and order, not just the book, the workbook, but order the answer book too. So that as you work through it, in my GED program, I have students that are on self-paced. Once I realize that, oh, you can get this, I give them the book and the, the answer book. And while I'm teaching class, I say, you start working through these concepts. It has the best um, illustrations, examples, how to work through a problem. And as soon as you get stuck, you come to me. I stop teaching. But that student is on self-pace. I took over this GED program a year ago, May. I walked into a room where you have some adults in a GED program longer than it takes to go back to high school. So I have two students who take the last section of their GED exam on the 19th, both of them started after me. Once I realized the potential, I said, oh no, self-paced and self-paced. You want that book for you, your kids, whoever. That's the book you want. Refresh your math, it's read. Mm -hmm. um, your name, Timoji, what do that mean? Sure, Timoji is a name that was made from three other names. So my birth name is Tisha, Monique Gilmore. Okay. T-I-M-O-G-I -I became Tomoji. And the word, and so I did not have a meaning. I looked for it. So I met a pastor. I did. I met a pastor about 20, 25 years ago who said to me, well, if you have this name and you can't find the origin, pray and ask God what it means. Amen. So I prayed, and this is what it means. I walk in the God-given light that's uniquely and completely my own. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So you find your Tomoji. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Regina Ratliff, and um, I'd like to know, when did you decide to go back to school? I, I heard the other elements, but I know you got your degree after you dropped out. So when did you decide in that? Sure. So I got married and had kids. I should have been class of 95. Mm -hmm. I came back in 2011 mm -hmm. and graduated from Bennett, went directly into my master's program, finished my master's in 2013, started my PhD online at Walden, then that was when the divorce happened. So I ended up having to drop out of school, but like I said, I'm ordained clergy. And the Bible College connected to my church assembly got accredited. So now I'm at the ABD portion in my doctor of ministry, right at basically my home church with my bishop. So it just, God just, he worked it all out. And don't have to go into a $100,000 worth of debt to do it. We'll take the last question. My name is Arthur Murphy. I'm a freshman in business administration. Sure. So again, I will tell you what happens on this campus. 
And because I've been on so many other campuses, as young women of color, you don't have to fight for your identity while earning your education. I, have a, I, I had, a, had to have surgery a few years ago. African-American woman, top in her field in North Carolina in the surgery that I needed. She was under 40, graduated from uh, Chapel Hill and then went to Duke Medical School. But if you hear the story, she will tell you. And she is fair, almost fair enough to pass. She is that fair, but if she will tell you the stories that are going on on those campuses, if you look at the completion rates for people of color at your Dukes, and I'm just using North Carolina because I live here, at your Dukes, at your Chapel Hills, at your Wake Forest, the completion rates for their doctoral students are low. Mm -hmm. Because you know, once you put in your uh, dissertation, it goes to a committee. They can send it back 50, 60 times if they want to. And there is nothing you can do about it. Nothing. So what I learned at Bennett was to be able to have a very strong constitution and to be able to do it as both a lady and a woman. At this moment, if you all could take a look at your name tags and find someone in the room that shares the same color as you, and just go talk to them. This is a networking opportunity. You can just interact. Good afternoon. Is everyone enjoying the conference? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, hello again. I just want to introduce myself again. My name is Jasmine Anglin. I'm a sophomore political science major from Albany, Georgia. I will be introducing our second keynote speaker, Ms. Kimberly A. Collins. Kimberly is a poet, lecturer, and author of Bessie's Resurrection, Choose You, Wednesday Wisdom to Wake Your Soul, and is writing for healing facilitator who gave voice to the movement against domestic violence with her poem, Remember My Name. Her poems and essays are published in several anthologies, journals, and magazines. She lives in Washington, D.C. and teaches English at Morgan State University. Please help me welcome Kimberly Collins. I thank you all for having me. And I especially thank Ms. Jeffries, Tamara Jeffries, for inviting me. I don't remember when I met Tamara, which means she's really a friend, because most of my friends, I never remember where we met. I do remember her inviting me to her apartment, her little apartment in Atlanta, Georgia, for dinner. And I thought, she's so classy. <laughs> it was, everything was set out. I think we even had tea. And I also remember that it's part of our journey as young women Tamara and I learned the value, the necessary, necess, necessity, uh, necessity of sisterhood. And we learned lessons in how to take care of that sisterhood as well. And, and one of the things that I wrote to my daughter when she turned 21 was that never forget your sisters. Don't put them on the back burner because you never know when you might need them to hold the cup of your tears or drive down the highway to go get your stuff. <laughs> but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> you know, because you get all busy with the guy, he's new and everything, right? Uh -huh. And then, right? Yes. And then, you know, once that goes to the wayside, then you got to call your sister, who you haven't talked to in months, and say, can you, can you help me? I need a co-pilot, because he got my stuff and I need to get it back. <laughs> but it was at Spelman. Yes, I'm a Spelman woman. Love y'all. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And of course, you know, as a freshman at Spelman, we, you know, we heard about the rivalry, but it's not really a rivalry, you know? And when um, I was there that year, when uh, Morehouse, 
selected a Bennett queen, mm -hmm. and we had a problem with that, so we had to boycott. It was like, how y'all gonna be playing over our yard all the time, <laughs> right? But the problem wasn't with the sisters, and you have to be real careful mm -hmm. that you know where to direct your anger yes. and your protest, right? So it was in the classroom with Dr. Gloria Wade Gales that she taught me how, and a lot of other sisters, how to claim our space by simply saying, claim your space, because we didn't want to, uh, I think, answer a question or we were just kind of shy coming into ourselves, and she continued to just tell us to claim our space. And that is a mo model I have just taken with me when I began my writing for healing workshops years ago. In fact, when people, when they start to uh, share the writing that comes out in the sister circle, I will tell them, don't raise your hand, just say, I claim my space. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to have so many spaces in your life where people are going to try to jump in it mm -hmm. and claim it for you. So get used to saying, I claim my space. And I actually take this into the classroom as well with my, my students at Morgan State. You know, I tell them, claim your space. Get used to it because it's too often people feel like it is easy for them to step into a zone that's yours. And this really became hmm, a lesson brought home when I was at a Furious Flower conference and I happened just to be hanging out with some brother poets and they were all kind of like kind of in a little, you know, kind of, you know, little huddle. And I felt honored that, you know, I was able to hang out, right? You know, I've always hung out with the guys. And they started talking about this sister poet who they said is always talking about black female erasure and, you know, and this and that and other about black women. And, you know, I think they called her the B word as well as they said, all she needed some dick. So I didn't say anything, and I didn't say anything because I ain't like the sister. And I felt bad about that later, because whether I felt bad, you know, whether I liked her or not, what they said about her, they were saying about all of us. And they were saying about me as well, to even feel comfortable to say that in front of me. But they didn't say it in front of me, because just like the sister talked about black female erasure, I was erased. I was invisible. They didn't see me, so I went back and I talked to one of my mentors, Monifa Love Asante, and I spoke with my other mentor, Sonia Sanchez, and Monifa said, well, what about Bessie? And I said, Bessie who? And she said, bigger's Bessie. I said, oh, I forgot all about Bessie. Because you can't have a bigger without a Bessie. You, you notice they had, they're bringing back Native Son, and I think a movie, HBO movie, as well as uh, there's some pl their plays, uh, performances in New York as well as in D.C. And, you know, I just, I, for me, I'm like, well, what about Bessie? I'm still, what about Bessie? You know, everything is centered around bigger. But if you read the text, and if you, if you really read the text, and if you really understand it, you can't have a bigger without Bessie. So, hence, I wrote Bessie's Resurrection. And I also wrote an answer to those brothers who said all she needed was some dick. As soon as I can find it. Bear with me. Uh, and if I get some dick, will I become dickmatized? Able to scale tall buildings? Leap from them in a single bound to dodge dick daggers? Will this dick heal my cuts from razors riding my lover's tongue, slicing me wide while I fail to glow from an orgasm I faked as mine? Will it bless me? Will it anoint my forehead, forcing me to kiss the holy scepter before it enters my temple of praise? And will I marvel at the dick's trick to erect itself? Uh, where am I? I'm sorry. Well, I heard it itself when I close my temple's door. Will this dick make me rich? Shoot out gold dust even though I have a diamond mind? Will this dick ear fuck me? So I'm deaf, dumb, and crazy when I'm called bitch, whore, scallywag, chicken head, or man-hating mad woman when I talk about sisterhood or survival. 
with his dick cradle me. The pieces of me chewed on with crooked teeth that consider me exotic dark meat, a medium rare delight or honey glazed treat to make me whole woman. Clutching their panting cocks, they don't say what kind of dick I need. Short, fat, stubby, long, pimply, pink, black, brown, beige, yellow. Any dick will do, like they all delicious. All my life, I've seen pint-sized and full-grown men gripping the front of their pants, jostling, fidgeting, repositioning, making room for their maleness that is not privileged in classrooms, boardrooms, locker rooms, and at one time, white-only bathrooms, only able to penetrate cell rooms and me. I've heard these same sad boys, these almost men, chant this tired punchline, like poets whose pens forgot to sing. So one of the reasons why I, write that, I wrote that poem was, thank you. And I wrote the book because it is about resurrecting our voices. Because it's essentially what they were saying was, you know, give her some dick to shut her up, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to claim her space, temper her voice because how dare she speak back or against her own invisibility. And as black women, we have to do that double time. We often hear about black men whose lives are in danger, but our lives are in danger as well. We are a package. I think about the women, the black women who could not stand with uh, the feminist movement at its birth the, during the suffrage movement because they had to choose or they were asked to choose between freeing all of us or letting just some of us vote. Well, hell, I, and so I understood Frances Harper, right? And she said, well, how am I just going to fight for the right for really for you to vote? And my people are still in bondage. So we have to understand why Alice Walker later says that we are womanists. We can't be feminists because we have to fight for all of us. The ones in color who are in bondage in terms of, of white supremacy as well as gender. So we, we can't, we don't have, we don't have the, what is it, the privilege to choose one over the other. So we have to always work on that duality. And I'm going to share another uh, poem with you, uh, two more, when I think about Bessie, just so Bessie Mears. So Bessie Mears is the, the, the character that I'm talking about. I'm also talking, I also give voice to Bessie Coleman as well as Bessie Smith. Bessie Smith serves as the soundtrack. And one of the really cool things that I found out about Bessie and her name was that it comes from Elishba. Did you all know that? Elizabeth, Beth, Sheba, the root name is Elishba, which means an oath pledged to God. So it's all African in its origin. I always have to share that because I just thought that was just so wonderful. <laughs> so I want to, and when, I, when we talk about, so this goes back to our invisibility. So, because one of the things that um, in the writing of this of this book was that even though I'm talking about Bessie Mears and I'm talking about Bessie Coleman and I'm talking about Bessie Smith, I'm talking about all of us. We all Bessie. We all know somebody named Bessie. But that's the next. That's the last poem. <laughs> Front page news. Hunt black in girl's death. A bold headline without mention of whether it be black woman, black dog, black cat, black rat. What is known is the girl murdered is white cause black girls don't make front page news. 5,000 police, vigilante squads, guns loaded, ordered to shoot any black whatever on sight. Bessie lost dumped, trying to save herself, digging, scraping her nails into the sides of an air shaft. Negro rapist faints at inquest. First responders hear a lone woman's hysterical wail. Her screams subside. The paramedics feel her fading pulse, dismiss her smashed skull, matted hair, blood glued. 
uneven tan bodies become one tenor sax moaning missing brown female bodies as revival him someone they thought they knew a woman easily forgotten S who is it what broken discarded blueberry black body did they find on a lone note Bessie Mears leaves her name scratched in concrete When we think about the missing black girls, right? When we think about the missing black girls, I, I think about this Bessie. And that's what, that's what I mean, where, we're, where we all become Bessie. Because they don't look for us. You don't, I, the, amber, the amber alert is not sounding our alarm. It's not for us. And we always know when it's one of us that's missing because there's, there's never any mention or a color associated. So why Bessie? And that's where I'm gonna, I'm gonna end up this conversation. And I guess we will open up for another conversation. Because we're all Bessie. Because we all know somebody named Bessie. Because as black women, we have to always operate as a collective. We don't have the privilege to get upset or divided because of the color or the, the hues of our skin or the texture of our hair. We have to stand together as one. And really, that's how we have persevered. I mean, you, you look at the housewives and all those folks, you know, the, you know that little minuscule parts of us or representatives of us, but they don't really represent me or anybody I know, acting a fool for some dollars, right? And most of us are either ashamed or we just watch it as a guilty pleasure. Sometimes I do. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think about us collectively, just the power and the strength and the beauty of the sisters, this sisterhood, I mean, I fell in love with it at Spelman. But the reason I was able to fall in love with it and the reason why Tamara and I have been able to remain sister friends all these years is because we had mothers who taught us about sisterhood. So it started in the home and I saw my mothers and her sisters and how they re retained and remain sisters, right? Even through the fights, you're gonna fight. You can critique who you love. And we have to be willing and open to receive that. Because if your sister can't tell you your hem is showing, who can? Now, I know you've walked down the street and you've seen two sisters together and one look jacked up. I ain't got another way to say it. <laughs> and you said, D -d 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 does she have a friend? Is that really a friend? Now, she might not have just listened to a friend. Mm -hmm. Or she just didn't have a friend because her friend wanted to look better. We can't afford those kinds of divisions or jealousies. And we have to always remember, like I, I love the, the name of this building, the global leadership, there's a global sisterhood. <laughs> and this is what you do with your sister that's in your immediate family, you need to think about that in a global sense as well. So why Bessie? Church, I wanna ask you, why not, Bessie? Ah, oh, when you ask the Lord, why me? He says, why not you? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Bessie was like any of you. She was black, she was female, she was poor, she was in love, she was a daughter, she was a hard worker, just like any of you. Why, Bessie? Why not, Bessie? Her name conjures up sleeping souls rocked in the belly of slave ships. Her blues first explode there in the bowels of this hellish ship that docked her and our forefathers on this foreign shore. She came womb weary, having dumped her load in Yimiya's arms. She expels more seeds and planted rose after drinking penny royal tea. This was her open revolt. She refused, refused to birth anyone that wasn't free. Her name is synonymous with both beast 
and woman. Teeth checked, nipples pinched, private parts probed in public places by pale face peeping toms. She is the muddy map of southern red clay stuck to her heels, plowing through stubborn earth, pulling weight that is never hers to turn over sto soil, to steal a yam, to cook, to remind her of home where festivals welcome the yam's arrival. Church. I said, church, I know Bessie Mears ain't the first Bessie you knowed. Who don't know an Aunt Bessie, Cousin Bessie, Grandma Bessie, Mama Bessie, Queen Bessie, or that woman named Empress that y'all sneak to the juke joint to see? Even Mr. got a mule named Bessie. Her name is a collective song sung into meaning. It means she knows something about somebody trying to ride the wheel out of you. It means her gnarled knuckles will not allow rings of deceit to slide over them for an unkempt promise. It means her unlettered words from her fire breath speak her bruised beauty out of box lives. Bessie is the celestial charmer, the secret keeper of the soil's healing power. Bessie's name hums meaning into lives which are real and imagined and hard. Her name, like her life, was a subtle blues note, a slow moan heard while spoon and stew. And church, I said, church, on that day when we thought she died, when they pulled her body out that cold chute, it was more than her that was raised from that place. No, brothers and sisters, Bessie didn't die in that chute. When she came up, all those Bessies who wore iron harnesses around their shoulders and on their backs, dragging unwanted weight, rose up to, yes, all those Bessies who waited upon the Lord had their strength renewed and mounted up with wings as eagles. They ran and were not weary no more. All those Bessies whose mouths were silenced with leather bits came out with her that day. They escaped Shadrach, Abednego, and Meshach's fiery furnace of woe. She was Jesus who suffered the blunt trauma to his skin, but not his spirit, rising again, asking, do you remember me? Church, do you remember him, the one that died on Calvary, nailed to a wooden cross? You ask, why? Why him, this mighty lamb of the world? Why? Why, Bessie? A woman who looked just like you, blended all our knighted memories of kingdoms and queens, buried in the dust track of our tears. I'm going to close now. But before I leave here today, I want you all to chew on this in the front of your minds. They say Jesus had 12 disciples, but that ain't true. They forgot Mary Magdalene and Jesus' own mama. So why Bessie? Because Bessie was one of them too. Thank you. another round of applause. I would like to open up the floor for a Q&A session. Yeah, can you stand up and state your name and where you're from? Yes, you can buy it today. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it is. It's Bessie's resurrection. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't. I, I, yeah. I, I need to get better about that. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Family Newman. Um, 
So where do you get your inspiration from? How do you even start being a poet? You know, you hear about poets and people will write poems. Uh, poem. Poem, thank you. <laughs> so how did that even come about? And do poems always have to rhyme? Or? Oh, please, no, no, they okay. don't have to rhyme. Okay. I can't stand them. Um, I mean, it would just depends on the form. Yeah. But it started in 1970 when my mother right there took me to see Nikki Giovanni at Black Expo. And she was on the podium and she said, Nigga, can you kill? Can you kill, nigga? And I said, Oh, I want to be that. <laughs> I want to do that. It's the truth. It's the truth. And then she gave me a book by Langston Hughes. And so it's exposure. And part of it is what it. What's your passion? What do you love to do? So I was always writing stories, and I've just always written. She'll tell you that I've been writing since I was three. I was, it was, I was seven. <laughs> um, but I have always written, and I had an epiphany about a month ago when I realized that this book really was about to be published. My, my press is indolent. And I said, wow, I came, it became the dream I had for myself. And Tamara knows, that's, the, that's one of the beauties too. And that's the reason why you need to kiss, keep your sister friends close to you, because they remember stuff from when you was, you know. And they bring it back up, remind you. <laughs> but so she's been on this poetry journey with me for a long time. And, and of course, not as long as my mama, but I've, I've always written and I've always read. And so you can't write unless you read. And I, and I was saying to someone, my father, he used to recite Poe's Raven by heart. And, and he could sing. So I'm pretty sure, you know, just having kind of that family influence is part of what led me to that. And when I teach writing workshops, my writing for healing workshops for people who, I, because I say, I think everybody can use writing as a tool to express themselves, to get past some of their own inner obstacles. And when I teach them, I give them what I call my writing training wheels. And you gotta come to a session to get that. But I give them my writing training wheels so that they're able to make the feelings tangible for themselves. So I think that you, there are things that you can learn and there are forms, of course, my one-on-one students right now I have them write poetry essays where we're looking at James Baldwin's text. If Bill Street could talk and they're to take a character or idea, pretty much as similar to what I just did with Bessie. So now I'm taking that to the classroom and having them do it. And, um, and they enjoy it because it gives them an opportunity to investigate and to look at the characters and some ideas in a more expansive way. And then I give them forms so that gives them a structure in which to uh, navigate and to investigate the characters and to write it out. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Kate Dale's class of 1977. I graduated in 1912. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, she asked part of the question that I was going to ask. Um, it seems like there was a time when we poetry a lot to tell our story mm -hmm. and maybe with the advent of technology and the spoken word we've gotten away from that a little bit. Can you talk about how powerful poetry still is for telling our story and how we can get back to that other than attending your workshop? Yeah. <laughs> um. I guess maybe because of my circles that I think that we are still using poetry. So yeah, it's all, so I think you have to expand the idea of, of what you see as poetry, right? Or how poetry shows up. Poetry shows up in music. It shows up in the way that we walk, in the way that we dance. Poetry can show up in a lot of, it shows up in the way that we articulate in a conversation, right? So there are a lot of ways that poetry still exists. When you're sitting at, when I'm sitting with my grandmother and she's telling me a story, and then I take that story and I, and I put it some, in a form on paper, but I'm, I'm taking her poetry, you know, I steal it a little bit, and I'm putting it on paper. So I think, you know, when you talk about spoken word, that there's this debate between the spoken word artists and the folks like myself who write, you know, 
really kind of depend on the page. Because my, I think my argument with the spoken word usually is can it hold up on the page? And I think that you have to be able to do both, but that doesn't discount it as poetry. Rap music is poetry. You know, so, you know, that whole hip hop revolution is still here, right? That's still, so poetry is still here. It's just the way that we want to, um, I guess, look at it, other, other terms that we use to define it. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's just what I mentioned. I don't know if anybody knows that we have the first black female poet laureate of North Jack, Carolina now. Jackie Shelton Green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know her. Yes. <laughs> oh. She's Really? I, I, okay. Uh, Robin Check here, graduate to 114, 60s baby. Okay. Also poet. <laughs> um, New York, sorry. Um, do you, so I want to get started with my teacher sitting next to me. In your experiences as a poet, because you've been a poet, all your life. What do you miss of the early years and the present? And what would you like to bring to the present from the early years for our younger poets? Take your time. Knowledge and appreciation of those poets, those antecedent poets. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Georgia Douglas. Knowing, because any time I teach uh, poetry, I always, and it, it, and it amazes me, how do you not know Gwendolyn Brooks? How do you not know Nikki Giovanni? How do you not know some of the, all of these early poets who have laid uh, a foundation for us. And so if you don't, if you don't, not clear about that foundation, then when you get here, you're going to be all over the place. And then you're going to, because I remember when I was coming through in the 80s and my friends now who are poet professors and so forth, and we were like joking about this, it's like, remember when we said, well, we don't need form, we're just going to do free form. You know, you know, form, that's, 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 that's white. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's craft. Yes. <laughs> so that's what I would say for the folks coming through now. Learn the craft. And because there was a time when I didn't have the craft. I had to go and get myself an MFA, right? And learn and, learn and appreciate forms and craft and learn that that's another, another way of telling a poem, you know, of sharing a poem. You know, when I have, when I teach um, a, a novel, when you're reading the novel, I say a novel is a layered text. Well, poems are layered too. And part of that layer is looking at the form and understanding why that poet chose that particular form. So knowing the craft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My dad. We have reached the time for the second breakout workshop session. These are the workshops, and a volunteer will direct you to those different rooms. And I have the pleasure of introducing our last and final keynote speaker, Dr. Acosta Barthwell Evans. Dr. Acosta Barthwell Evans is the CEO of the Barthwell Group, a strategic manage management consulting firm based in Detroit with consultants in eight states and 14 subject matter experts in the U.S. and in Africa. The Barthwell Group has, has advised more than 25 higher education institutions, Fortune 100 corporations, and the military. Prior to founding the Barthwell Group, Dr. Evans was a managing director at J.P. Morgan Chase in New York, where she developed and ran two national businesses, both in private bank and in asset management. Dr. Evans has served on more than 16 not-for-profit boards throughout the United States, including the Yale Alumni Association Board of Governors, and was the founder 
and chair for many years of the Friends Foundation, Friends of Education at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. She was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve on the President's Advisory Commission for Educational Excellence for African Americans. She is a graduate of the Yale Law School, where she was co marshal of her class and has a PhD in Masters of Philosophy from Columbia University. She also holds a Bachelor's of Arts from Bernard College. She is the daughter of Abena Bell, Gladys Whitfield Barthwell, and the grandniece of former Bennett, Co Bennett College President David Dallas Jones. She is also the mother of Walter K. Evans. Please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Acosta Evans. Sorry guys for the technical <laughs> difficulties. Oh, okay. That's okay. Um, hello and uh, thank you so much. Oh Jesus. I'm sorry guys. Okay. Thank you so much and um, this is for me not just a speech but it's really a homecoming as you'll hear in a few minutes. And what I'd like to do in the few minutes that I have to talk with you is uh, to just share with you uh, a little bit of my background in addition to what Tashani has mentioned. Uh, talk to you about what have been some of my proudest accomplishments, but most importantly, to share with you the lessons that I've learned over the years for a roadmap to success. Um, so, as you were told, I am the daughter of a Bennett Bell, Gladys Marie Wayfield, as she was known then. And um, she was the niece of David Dallas Jones, who is the president of Bennett College, who transformed it into a college to educate African American women. And I just want to say a few words about her because I think she epitomizes what Bennett means and what it meant to me to have a mother who was a Bennett Bell. My mother was always on time, she was always prepared. And she was, thank you, she was always gracious to everybody. But also, she firmly believed in giving back to, to the community. So without getting into any rivalries, she was the president of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority uh, in Detroit. And at that time, which somebody has mentioned, young women who had a child out of wedlock were ostracized. She started something called the Delta Home for Girls, which gave these young women a place where they could be respected, finish their education, and care for their children. She married my father, and we've been talking about entrepreneurship. So my father was a pioneer entrepreneur. He came from Albany, he came from Cordial, Georgia, which didn't even have any schools, public schools for blacks. Moved to Detroit and established 13 drugstores and patent medicine stores and had his own ice cream company that had over 15 flavors, which no other African American has ever um, duplicated. And he was a nice person <laughs> to say that to and helped to write the Michigan Constitutional Convention. So some of my proudest accomplishments, I won't dwell on this because um, I've already been very well introduced, but I am proud of the fact 
that um, I integrated the school. I know some of you younger people don't even know what that is. But I integrated a very exclusive girls school in Michigan and ended up being the president of that school in the top five academically. At okay. uh, Barnard College, which is the Women's College of Columbia University, when I entered, there were only six African-American women in our class of 300. I was one of two students who went to the Dean of Admission and asked why, was told we don't know where to find any African-American women in the South. They said, well, we'll find them. And when I graduated, there were over a hundred African American women at Fire College. Um, and I'm also proud of the fact that I have established uh, two scholarship funds. One was at Wayne State University, where my father went to school, and that has helped countless African American pharmacy students by providing grants for their education. And the other was at the Yale Law School, um, which uh, has provided many grants to allow particularly graduates from HGCUs, because in my Yale Law School class, there were only two. And also uh, first-generation students with partial scholarships to attend the Yale Law School. So I believe in the same Bennett tradition of giving back to your community. Yes. I was also, um, as managing director at J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, one of the first African Americans on Wall Street to do that, but also to run and develop two businesses which were focused on providing more opportunities for African Americans, and particularly HBCUs, to become clients of J.P. Morgan Chase. Very few when I started. And I'm proud to have started my own company, the Barflow Group, which is mentioned, is a strategic management consulting company. Excellent. These are some of our uh, team members. You can see we're very diverse. Excellent. And these are some of our clients. So 25 higher education institutions, but many uh, large corporations like the largest defense contractor in the world, Lockheed Martin, and for the Marines. So here are 10 steps that to me are extremely critical to be successful. And you'll notice that the first four all have to do with how do you relate to other people? So the first is the importance of respecting everybody. I've seen so many people make the mistake of trying to figure out, well, who should I respect? They want to meet the CEO of a large corporation. So they kind of butter up to that person and ignore the assistant, not realizing that assistant is going to be the person that's going to enable you to get to the CEO. So it's important to respect everyone. Be a team player. This is something that has been studied and analyzed. It's a very important characteristic for success, not only in business, but in life. What you do for other people, being able to collaborate, being able to communicate with them, these are all important skills. The next is add value. Wherever you are, add value. What does that mean? It means have you made a difference in any situation? And have others benefited from you being there? Very important. Get involved in your community. I have served on over 16 boards throughout the United States. And most of these boards, the purpose is to give back, to help a community, to help an organization. But what I have found is I have usually gained more than I've given back, just in the experience, the gratification it brings you, and also the people you're meeting on these boards who then in turn 
are going to refer you to other opportunities. Overprepare. It's an old adage in the African American community that we have to be excellent to be considered good. And that is extremely true. So you, so you want to read the fine print. And you always want to be the smartest person in the room. That doesn't mean you're there to dominate. But it means that you build a reputation as somebody who always does his or her homework and who's well prepared. Speak up. There are so many studies that show that we women typically do not speak up. We always feel like, oh, I, I don't, I'm not clever enough, or I'm not quite sure. And so this uh, means that sometimes we don't say things. Uh, I went to Yale Law School divorced as a single mother with a six-year-old son. And I, so I was typically in the library. But one time I joined the study group, and we took an exam, and the questions seemed to have nothing to do with what we had studied. I asked one of the members of the study group, a male, I said, what, is, what do those questions mean? They didn't seem to have anything to do with the class. He said, yeah, I didn't think they did either, but I just made up an answer. <laughs> and that just is an example of how oftentimes men feel like, okay, I can just make it. And we would say, well, wait a minute. Does this relate to something that I'm sure is correct? Be open to change. Again, the world is changing, and innovation is extraordinarily important. Statistics show that most people are going to change careers sometime, someplace between 11 and 15 times in your professional career. Another statistic is you are being prepared for when you're in college for jobs that do not currently exist. So it's okay to say, I would like to be a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor. I can tell you, I knew nothing about Wall Street when I was in high school. I went to college to become a novelist. I will say I have now completed two manuscripts. But the point is, a lot of things happen. My first job was at the United Nations. I had no idea that I would ever have that type of uh, opportunity. So you've got, to, you've got to be open to new experiences. And you have to take risks. When I was an attorney, I was the uh, chief of lawyer for something called Krispy Kreme. I don't know if you've heard of that. <laughs> okay. And it was their IPO, Initial Public Offering. And I went up, and this is something else about speaking up, and talked to the person from J.P. Morgan and said, oh, you know, I've never worked on any transaction where there was more, where there was another African American. And I want to compliment you because on this transaction there were four of us and the others were from J.P. Morgan. And he kind of said, oh, well, thank you. I set up the equity desk. Um, and now I'm taking over the private bank. And I'm going to focus on entertainers and athletes. And I said very politely, but very firmly, well, if I were you, I wouldn't do that. And he said, well, why not? I said, I think you should focus on business people. And he basically looked at me like, oh, are there African-American business people? He didn't say that, but that was the look. And this led to an opportunity to come up, be flown to New York at the time I lived in Atlanta, and to go on a series of interviews without anyone ever telling me I was being interviewed. And the result was I did get the job in banking, which I had no experience doing before. And I went on to come to the highest level on Wall Street, except to be an officer, so I was a managing director. 
So that's just an example. <laughs> so that was just an example of you have to be bold, take the opportunity, etc. Be global. Our world is really changing. So if you look statistically at U.S. corporations, you're going to see that more and more of their revenues are coming from overseas. And you're also seeing that more and more foreign corporations are coming to the United States. So what this means is you cannot say to yourself, well, I guess I'll prepare myself to work in Raleigh. Because the opportunities are global. And what does that mean to you as students or to anyone? Learn other languages. Extremely important in being competitive. You've got to know how to communicate with other people. The other is be sensitive and make friends with people from different countries. And, and, and today, you can do that at, you know, wherever you live, but you can also do that through the internet. And travel. Any opportunity you have to travel, particularly to travel overseas, always take it. Because it's preparing you to be competitive in our new society. Now this, this guideline, Many people will say, well, what does this have to do with success? Because people tend to define success in terms of money many times. But that is not really the way to define success. But staying healthy is critically important. And again, there are statistics showing a correlation between exercise Exercise doesn't have to mean taking out an expensive gym membership. It can be as simple as walking around your campus a few times every day. But it's extremely important. It helps your thinking, your clarity, uh, and it's going to help your longevity. The next thing is eat healthy. Oftentimes, we really don't do that. We're, we're rushing, so we say, oh, just give me this hamburger, or let me just do this. But everyone has the opportunity to know what a healthy diet is. And once again, there is a correlation between eating healthy, having clarity, it improves your cognition, and it's going to make you a stronger person. Get enough sleep. Again, these things sound simplistic. But again, studies have shown that persons who sleep two hours less than their peers are likely to score lower on tests. So get, everyone has a different amount of sleep that you might need. For me, I need about eight or nine hours. But it's something you have to start prioritizing. The final thing is something, again, that sounds very simplistic, but many people don't do it in today's world. Relax. My father lived to be 99. And I didn't live, I lived in New York a lot of the times, but we were we always had a close family, so I call him up. One day I called him up and I said, Hi Dad, what are you up to? He said, I fell and I can't get up, but your brother is on his way over here. You fell. <laughs> he said, just calm down. He said I'm watching the Pistons game. <laughs> and I'm just saying, I don't know, I'm not a medical doctor, but he had a sense of, if I can't solve the problem, I'm not going to stress myself out about it. So he had fallen, he called up my brother, and he said, can you please come and help me get up? He knew my brother would come, 
And he was watching the Pistons game. <laughs> and the final is dress for success. Now today we have very relaxed dress codes in many environments. But again, how you present yourself is how others perceive you. And again, there's actually been studies that have shown there's a relationship between dressing more formally and how you are perceived and your ability to think clearly, et cetera. That's, that's extremely important because the other fact of life we have to realize is oftentimes when we are African Americans, we're going to be perceived differently. There's going to be perceptions about us, prejudices, etc. So how we look, even if somebody else next to us doesn't look particularly well groomed, there are going to be more perceptions about what that means when it applies to us. So those are the 10 kind of guidelines that have helped me in my career. And even though I was asked to talk specifically about business, I think that these guidelines apply in anything you do. Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Angela Freckleton, political science freshman um, major from Mobile, North Carolina. I heard that you said that you worked in the United Nations. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? Um, it was extremely interesting. Um, it was very, it was a long time ago, and so, and again, it came about uh, in an unplanned fashion. So, I was always very politically active in college and graduate school, and so someone deserved, um, observed me when I was demonstrating against apartheid. Does anyone know what that is? Was? Yeah. What was? When they were fighting over. Pardon? You mean with apartheid? Yeah. When they were trying to get their, like someone, they were in Africa, they were trying to get their freedom from the. Yeah. Well, it was a system of extreme racial segregation and war in, in Southern Africa. Uh, so blacks were not able to vote. In some places, their land was taken away. And as they resisted, they were countered with violence. Prison, I'm sure people have heard of Nelson Mandela, but in many parts of Southern Africa, there are other names of heroes that we just don't know. So because I was demonstrating against that, someone from the UN, who because they had something called the Center Against Apartheid, observed my leadership and, and said, and they had no African Americans at the center. So he asked me, um, would I like to come and work there? And I said, sure. So I was a political affairs officer. That meant I wrote papers about the situation in South Africa. But also part of my job was to try to make Americans, and particularly African Americans, more aware of what was going on in Southern Africa. So I organized conferences, um, you know, talked about it. And it was interesting, you know, I met Muhammad Ali because he came to, to uh, speak against what was going on there. I was asked to organize an art exhibit because some artists from the Caribbean wanted to donate the sales from their work for the anti apartheid an anti-apartheid movement. So it was a very interesting experience. And I was hired by the United Nations, which was also unusual, as opposed to representing the U.S. government. But I, I met Andy Young. Uh, you know, he was uh, the person who late, later became the head, Secretary General from Ghana. He was on that committee. So I met a lot of people. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. I was really interested in your comments about exercise and health overall. And I, I'm, I'm uh, teaching the Department of Journalism and Media Studies. And I'm wondering, what can we do as professors to structure that exercise into our programs that the students are kind of coming 
take classes with you, right? Okay, so I can answer that um, from a couple of perspectives. So uh, I used to be a board member of Bennett uh, for nine years. And when President Cole was here, she would take students on walks around the campus. I, I think she did that every morning, if I'm not mistaken. One of our uh, core team members is a retired two-star general uh, from the Army, African-American. And he used to, I, I don't know, this is too extreme, but he would have his uh, men run along and give their daily reports. So as it was their turn to report, they'd run up to the top of the line. So I think one of the things, it can be simple things. I don't know, you know, how, what flexibility you have in your classes. It could be having your class outside sometime. It could be uh, you know, I, you have to obviously get the subject across, but it could involve some portion of the instruction where actual exercise was, was going along. But as students and others, I mean, you can take the leadership and you could give awards. You know, they don't have to be monetary, but certificates for professors who encourage this or students who do that. And, and you'll find that it really does make you feel better. And I, and I was smiling because that was a lesson that came to me later in life. <laughs> I didn't, my brother, uh, who's the same age I am, a year older, younger, has completed 14 marathons. And I, he and I started at the same time and said, oh, we're gonna, you know, go and exercise. And I, after about three blocks, I said, oh, my ankle hurts, I gotta go back home. But he went on and, um, you know, just became part of his daily routine. Any other questions? Yes. I'm curious about your name, because your family seems very traditional, but Akosa is not a traditional first name. It is not. And um, so actually, when I was a, uh, junior in college, you know, because I had integrated the school, um, I, I, the school I went to had no information about African Americans pretty much except to say that George Washington Carver had invented many things from the peanut. Literally, that was about all, and, and slavery. We talked about slavery. So when I got to college, um, I took a course on international politics and learned about Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. And so I was very uh, fascinated and decided I wanted to go to, to Africa. And so I went and I spent a summer there in Ghana. And in Ghana, if you talk to most Ghanaians, you'll find out that everyone has a so-called market day name, which means whatever day of the week you're born on, you have a name. My name means born on Sunday. So there's, and the, the male name would be Kwesi. You might have heard that name. So I decided that summer I would uh, adopt the name Akosia. I pronounce it Akosia. And so when I got back home, it was kind of funny because my father, as I said, was a very mild-mannered person. And somebody called me up and asked for a Kosia. And, and he slammed down the phone and said, Dad, what's wrong with you? He said, somebody called over here looking for a Kosis. <laughs> so I just decided to take that name. A lot of people at the time were adopting African names, and many of them were, were extremely complex. And I thought, this is an easy name, and I liked it. So I've used it for over 30 years. Any other questions? OK, well, I want to say again, uh, one thing I forgot to say, I want to thank particularly Dr. Selby, Dr. Dawkins, but I want to thank the students because it's very inspirational to me that students would have played such a role, and let me not forget you, in planning this event. And I really know that you have the power 
to do anything and to accomplish anything. And I, and I really believe you will. And um, it's really, it really does mean a lot to me that you invited me to speak because Bennett is extremely special to me. Thank you. At this moment, we would like to call our, we would like to recognize our keynote speakers for coming to the first annual Ebony Excellence Conference. <laughs> we would like to thank them with a small token of appreciation. Can we please have Dr. Koswa Bothwell Evans come up front? Kimberly A. Collins. And Timoji Jackson. for sharing your valuable knowledge as a keynote speaker during the first Ebony Excellence Conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so I'll take it. Will someone take one for me on my phone too? For you. Thank you. Thanks. I met your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Can we please give one more round of applause for our phenomenal keynote speakers? I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank the dedicated Tri Chair team, the founding student leaders who planned and launched the inaugural Ebony Excellency Conference. Jasmine <laughs> Anglin, Tashion Castillo, and of course, myself. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to um, give a big thank you to, um, on behalf of my team, to Dr. V. Selby, Mariska Selby, who was the driving force behind the success of this conference. Yeah. The Tri Chair is highly honored to have worked under the guidance of such a powerful, organized, and focused mentor. Our most heartfelt gratitude goes to you, Dr. Selby. Would it be possible for her to come up and could we get the pictures of the four of you? Sure. <laughs> 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 Look at my little studio. I know. <laughs> so. uh -huh. Uh -huh. So many cameras, like which direction? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
think you're the wrong thing. Um, now I want to give a big thank you to our volunteers who helped the tri-chair manage the logistics of the conference and ensure the overall safety and enjoyment of all our guests. Our volunteers this year were Trinity Jones, is she in? <laughs> Jasmine Miners, Felicia Park, Nia Watson, Naomi Dolby, Anaya Wells, and Angela Franklin. I also want to uh, express our most heartfelt gratitude to Sylvia Nicholson, Delmas Wilson, Yamranai Kurewa, Tamara Jeffries, Dr. Sarah Wren, Aisha Lassiter, Elizabeth Irving, John Williams, Laurie Williams, oh, sorry, Laurie Willis, Patricia Woodward, Dr. Ann Hayes, Kimberly Dry Dancy, Dr. Michelle Linster, Dr. Annette Wilson, Tracy D. Jones, Campus Campus Safety, um, Sedaxo, that's the company that prepared the food that we ate for lunch, and um, all about Awards Recognition Incorporation. They are the ones who did our little appreciation tokens. We also want to um, acknowledge Aziz Peregrino Brima. He is the one who designed our beautiful logo. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, I have Shakira M. Jones who designed uh, the program. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, I have Professor Lipscomb. He is the one <laughs> behind on the camera. <laughs> He, he dedicated all his day to us and we appreciate that. I also want to say thank you to our Bennett College president. She is an icon on keeping Bennett alive. In our, she's not in our midst today, but she would have loved to be here. The pre president has shown support and empowerment by allowing us to initiate the existence of this EEC and we want to thank her for that opportunity. Last but not least, I want to thank you all, our guests, for coming to support us. We do not take it lightly. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.